There are strains of an echo in this place. seems to be fading already. That chorus is inside you, inside us. It's diminishing in a loss of focus, a deflation of faith. How can we, How can keep, we keep the music, the music and, the and the clink and the clamor of the world resumes? When the struggle of life resounds, when the noise of battle overwhelms the song. But we have been to the mountain, you and I, Nothing can be the same. This is true. true. Emmanuel, Emmanuel is God with us, and, and we are met. met. We, we have found the light. light. We, we have heard the music. music. We, we have, have looked, looked upon the child, warmed to the love, experienced the healing, accepted, accepted the promises. Everything, Everything has changed. changed. We, we have seen, seen the Lord. Lord. Amen. Let us worship God. Thank you.
us. I believe he came for one, he came for all. Heaven's child became a man, gave his life for me in spite of all. I am, I believe. Today we are in that spot between Christmas when the shepherds went to Bethlehem to see this thing which had been made known to them and Epiphany when the wise men following the star finally arrived at the house where Jesus was. This is a strange in-between spot. What are we to do with ourselves? You think of the 20th verse of Luke's second chapter where after the evangelist has told the birth story and the narrative is rapidly approaching its own in-between spot, he says, and the shepherds returned. The shepherds returned. That is the rub precisely for us. The shouting and singing and festivities are over. The shepherds are on their way back home. The gifts are all open, piled under the tree, or stuffed into drawers and closets, or strewn over the playroom floor. The lights are being put away, and the dead pine needles swept up. The angelic chorus is over and silent for another year, as one waitress in a local restaurant said to me, Christmas music has been driving me nuts for a month now. Life is returning to normal, whatever that means. From the mountaintop experience of Christmas, that is, we find ourselves afoot on the road that leads back to the humdrum of everyday life. For the shepherds, I guess, that meant back to their smelly old sheep. Their long hours of vigil guarding the lambs with nary a book to read, facing more cold, dangerous nights on the dark Galilean hillsides. Scripture doesn't say that any one of them was so inspired by the nativity as to leave their lowly occupation to become missionaries or social workers or clergymen or religious TV talk host, show hosts. So if we can picture them back on the hillside now that the hubbub is over, they probably seem very much the same as before it all started. And yet, for the shepherds, life after that first Christmas couldn't possibly have been the same. They couldn't have helped but to take the divine glory of the manger back with them to their daily vocation and allowed that vocation, even they themselves, to be transformed. Indeed, we read the scriptures which say that the shepherds didn't merely return at all, but returned glorifying and praising God for the things they had heard and seen. They didn't just interrupt their daily routines to go gape at the Christ child for a bit, the way we take a vacation. They bore the experience, the excitement, the hope, the promise back home with them, back to life, back to business, back to work. 
That's what these high mountaintop experiences in the church year are supposed to do for us. Give us penetrating, permeating visions of the good news that God has delivered right here in the fabric of our otherwise ordinary, unremarkable lives. So that we can be ambassadors for our Christ in the office, on the construction site, in front of the refrigerator, in the car. We're not to think to ourselves, well, that's one world and this is another. We're too to return glorifying and praising God for the things we have heard and seen. Human nature doesn't exactly work that way. We're inclined to say, ah, oh, too bad it's over. It was nice while it lasted, so exhilarating. If only real life could be like that. But it's back to the old grind now, I guess. That's how Peter saw it, remember? At the transfiguration in the company of Jesus and Moses and Elijah, Peter was in his glory. What a jag, he thought to himself. Let's build some tents right here and live in them right here and stay here always so that the excitement lasts forever. But Jesus said, no. No. They all had to come back down the mountain, face the human need and the human condition once more, back to school, back to the jobs that are unpleasant, back to the problems and fears we forgot in the giddiness of the holiday for a moment, back to the car troubles and the bills and the figuring out of income tax. But you won't find much biblical cheerleading for the kind of monasticism we instinctively hanker for when Christmas is past. We're not invited to sequester ourselves from reality in order to cultivate the vision beautific. Mm -mm. Our high points of spiritual experience are meant to be brought to bear directly on the valleys of our everyday lives, their problems, their people, their pain. We're meant to be not recluses, but relators, relating what God has shown us of his uncommon glory to life as we experience it commonly, so dull, so drab, so often threatening. Mark chapter 5, verse 19, as you heard this morning, the soul who met Jesus in such a demonstration of power and love that he was transformed from an old man of legion into a new man of wholeness and redemption and healing begged the master, take me with you, take me with you. And Jesus said, here's what I want you to do. Go home. Go home. Tell your friends what I have done for you. What mercy I have shown you. So, now, today, after Christmas, what have you and I learned of what the Christ has done for us and of the mercy that we've been shown? Let's hear it again. Consider it again. Visualize it again. Believe it again. I am bringing you good news of a great joy that will be to all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. You will find him. You will find him wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim this 
the year of God's favor. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to Jesus, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will be safe. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side. 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Have faith in God. I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and you do not doubt, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. Whatever you say in prayer, whatever you ask in my name, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Because I live, you shall live also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, what I have told you that I go there to prepare a place for you? And if I go, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also in Jesus graciously give us everything we need? Who shall bring any charge against God's chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is the condemned? No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. There is a certain sadness, humanly speaking, to the passing of the season with all its glamour and glitter, and to the realization that we must go back to life as it was, to the invoices and taxes, the regular hymns and usual communions, the same old unspectacular things. But if Christmas has meant something to us, really, 
you and I will return glorifying and praising God for the things that we have heard and seen in some way as the shepherds did. And we'll find that our lives and our vocations aren't the same anymore at all. Oh, not because they're different in some substantial way, of course. But because we are. Let us pray. We thank you, most gracious God, for bringing your son into the world for making of him the fabric of creation, for teaching us through his finitude and his divinity both, that you are indeed with us and we have seen you because we have seen Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.